first let me just describe the general phenomenon I'm talking about. A person in whatever culture he finds himself one day notices that life is difficult. He notices that in the best of times, even in the best of times, no one close to him has died. Uh, there are no hostile armies massing in the distance. The fridge is stocked with beer and the weather is just so. Even, even when things are going as well as they can go, he notices that, that at the level of his attention, moment to moment, he is seeking happiness and only finding temporary relief from his search. And we, we've all noticed this, and we all we, we seek pleasant sights and sounds and tastes and sensations and attitudes. We uh, become connoisseurs of art and music and literature. But our pleasures are, by their very nature, fleeting. I mean, the best we can do is merely reiterate them as often as we are able. If we enjoy some great professional success, this remains vivid and intoxicating to us for about an hour, maybe a day. Uh, but then people begin to ask you, well, what are you going to do next? You know, don't you have something in the pipeline? Uh, I mean, Steve Jobs releases the iPhone. I, I'm sure it was, wasn't 20 minutes before someone came up to him and said, when are you going to make this thing smaller? <laughs> now, notice at this juncture, very few people say, oh, I'm done. Uh, I've met all my goals. And now I'm just going to stay here and eat ice cream until I die in front of you. <laughs> Even when things have gone as well as they can go, the search for happiness, the, search, the, the effort required to keep boredom and dissatisfaction and doubt at bay continues. At the very least, death and the loss of loved ones interrupts at, at regularly even the most well-ordered and gratifying life. So in, in this context, many people have begun to wonder whether or not a, a, a different form of well-being a deeper form of well-being exists, a, a, a form of well-being that is not contingent upon merely reiterating one's pleasures and avoiding one's pains. Now, is there a form of happiness that is not contingent upon always having one's favorite food available to be placed on one's tongue, or having one's friends and family within arm's reach, or having good books to read, or having something to look forward to on the weekend? Is, is it possible to be happy before anything happens, before one's desires get gratified, in the very midst of life's vicissitudes, in the very midst of old age, disease, and death. Now, I think this question lies at the periphery of everyone's consciousness. But we, we are all, in some sense, living our answer to this question. And many of us are living as though the answer is no. No, there is nothing more profound than seeking satisfaction moment to moment. There's nothing more profound than reiterating your, your pleasures, sensory, emotional, intellectual. So many of us are living as though there's nothing to do but just keep our foot on the gas until we run out of, out of road. But certain people, for whatever reason, wonder whether or not there's, an, there's another strategy to be adopted than this. And many of them are led to wonder this by religion, by the example of people like the Buddha and Jesus and the, the literature that has grown up around these figures. And, they, and these people begin to practice various techniques of introspection, often call, called meditation or contemplation, uh, as, just as a means of training their attention on their moment-to-moment -moment experience to see if there is a deeper basis of well-being to be discovered at all. They might even go into a cave for months or years at a time, or an ashram or some other secluded spot. Why would a person do this? Well, it's actually a very simple experiment. I mean, here, here's the logic of it. If there is a form of happiness to be found that is not contingent upon merely reiterating your pleasures, then it should be available in a circumstance where all obvious sources of pleasure have been removed. It should be available to someone who has gone to some secluded spot in the desert or in a cave, who, who has declined to marry her, her high school sweetheart, who has renounced all of her material possessions. It should be available in a context where, where the, uh, 
that, that would on its face be deeply uncongenial to the satisfaction of ordinary desire and ordinary aspiration. Now, one clue as to how daunting most of us and most people would find such a project is that solitary confinement, which is essentially what we're talking about, is considered a punishment even inside a prison. I mean, even when, when confined with homicidal maniacs and rapists, most people still prefer the company of others to the prospects of being alone in a box for a significant stretch of time. And yet contemplatives for millennia claim to have found extraordinary depths of, of psychological well-being in circumstances very much like solitary confinement. Now it seems to me, as rational people, whether we call ourselves atheists or not, we have a choice to make in how we view this whole enterprise. I mean, either the contemplative literature is a mere catalog of psychopathology and deliberate fraud and religious delusion, or people have been having interesting and sometimes normative experiences under the banner of mysticism and, and spirituality. I mean, leaving aside all the metaphysics and mythology and mumbo jumbo, what contemplatives and mystics over the ages claim to have found is that there is an alternative to living at, at the mercy of the next neurotic thought that comes careening into consciousness. There's an alternative to being continuously spellbound by this conversation we are having with ourselves. And most of us think that if a person is walking down the street talking to himself, that, that is not able to censor himself in front of other, pe other people, he's probably mentally ill. But if we talk to ourselves all day long, silently, thinking, 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 rehearsing prior conversations, thinking about what we, what we should have said, we could have said, we might yet say, we just know enough to keep this silent, then this is perfectly normal. This is, this is perfectly compatible with, with basic human sanity. Well, the experiences of contemplatives over the millennia suggest that this is not so, that there's another way of looking at, at this phenomenon. Now, of course, I'm by no means denying the importance of thought. I think thought is obviously indispensable for us. It's the basis of most culture. It's certainly the basis of all science. Uh, it's the basis of all of our social relationships. And linguistic thought is surely responsible for much rudimentary cognition. I mean, it's, it's responsible for our ability to integrate planning and, and explicit learning and um, moral reasoning in many cases. I mean, even talking to oneself out loud might serve a function occasionally. But from the point of view of our contemplative traditions, and this is to reduce them all down to a cartoon version that, that ignores the rather esoteric disputes between them, our, habi our habitual failure to recognize thought as thought, our, our habitual identification with discursive thought is a primary source of human suffering. And when a person breaks this spell, an extraordinary kind of relief is available. 